If you're a lawyer, you call them whores. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's a bad word. But these are people that you pay as a lawyer to come in and tell you what you want to happen. If you are a lawyer and you want a certain result, then you know a doctor or a place you can go as an expert to get the result you want. Licensed attorney, award-winning writer, businessman, entrepreneur, and other over-the-top crap, it's Life and Law with Eugene Sisko, Jr. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to Real Life and Law podcast here with Eugene Sisko. My name's Katie. I'm, I'm co-host with Eugene. And I'm Eugene. Eugene, I actually have a question. Do you prefer... Do you prefer if I call you Eugene Cisco or Eugene Cisco Jr.? Uh, junior is, uh, you know, when I was little, uh, from my neighborhood, I always know if someone knows me from when I was under the age of 15 because they call me Junior because my daddy was Eugene. Would they just right. call you Junior or would they call, call me you Junior? Whole- no, just, in just fact, I wrote, uh, I wrote a book, a series of short stories back a long, long time ago called Just Junior. And it was about me growing up, and they were very crude, and it's when I was first learning to write. But so my son is Eugene the Third. So now my dad has passed, and where I live now, no one knows my father. Don't even. So when they, when they, cause me and my son live in the same community. So when I say Eugene Junior, they think of my son. Got it. Not the third. And so then I just, I don't even say junior anymore. I don't mind it. I actually kind of like it, but no one knows me by that. You can call me Eugene. Just I'll just call Eugene. you Eugene. It's yeah. so much easier for me as yeah, well. Yeah, Eugene, <laughs> Gene. You wrote a short story about your life? I, I have written an award-winning, I've written several things, okay? A lot. I'm a writer. I am a writer by nature. Uh, so... I started writing in school newspapers, and then I went to college and and wrote for my college newspaper. Then I wrote for the newspaper, back home newspaper. At one time, myself, my father, and my brother, who is extraordinarily a gifted writer, but he's lazy and he has a drinking problem. So um, he works at a newspaper now. So at one time, all three of us wrote for a weekly newspaper in Kentucky. And uh, for two years in a row, each of us won first place in our own little um, column areas. I wrote like a human interest column. Mm -hmm. uh, And my dad wrote more um, old-timey, folksy kind of stuff. And my brother was more of an editorialist. And so we all won first place. At wow. these writers associations. Yeah. So then I did that. I started writing grants uh, at the work I was at. And in the meantime, I was tinkering around with short stories because that's the medium. I really like short stories. That's my favorite. And so I wrote a series of short stories called A Little East of Eden and really loved them. A bunch of is about a bunch of character, characters that come to this small town that is not unsimilar to the one that I was raised in. And they came there for a minute and stayed the rest of their life. Very odd people. So it's a, the, the town is a collection of all the people that I've met in my life. So I, a lot of these characters are real and or based on real people. So I submitted probably 15 years ago. I was really down on my luck, um, not making any money. Just I you know, had kids before I went to law school. Uh, just struggling, you know, food stamps, everything. So I had submitted these uh, collection. Uh, there was four of them I submitted to the National, uh, to Kentucky Arts Council. It's a very prestigious literary um, group. So they gave away a $5,000 prize for fiction and they gave away 5000 for nonfiction and they do it for poetry. They try to help support the arts. So I thought, well, shit. You know, I'll throw them out there. So I threw them out there. And, you know, and by that time, I had started throwing shit out there to magazines and things and had 
very modest success, just small magazines. We, my wife, who we were at this time truly financially in trouble, so she came screaming. I was working at the college, at the university. She came to me screaming one evening. I was just getting off work, screaming. We did. So just like she was like screaming. Yeah. I thought, holy shit, something is wrong with the kids. I always think that. If you've got kids, when someone is hysterical, it's a kid problem. Or it ought to be. So I'm like, oh, my God, what, what what's wrong? She said, you won. You won. You won. I thought, what, what did I win? I've forgotten because I've done so much of this. You just forget. Mm-hmm. She said, I showed me a check for $5,000. So that's where I started writing. And uh, I thought, well, shit, somebody else thinks I'm good, which is kind of <laughs> nice, right? Because it's not just me. No matter what you do in your life, I've learned, no matter what you do in your life, if you love what you're doing, you're, the people that love you and that are around you, when you talk about what you do and what you love, you can see their eyes roll back in their head. And they're just waiting. Oh, holy shit. They keep talking about this. And if you say, well, what do you think about this? Few people are going to say to you, oh, you don't know, that writing's not worth shit. You know, I don't really like it. It was horrible. They're not going to say it. They're going to say, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> they're going to do that. Yeah. So you just, I get you, if it's something you do, you just understand that. And I don't ask for people, I don't ask for people to read my stuff anymore. My wife is the only one that reads my stuff. And that's because, She's really good at reading. So I'll let her read it to me. I won't let her critique it. I said, I just need you to read this to me so that I can hear it. You know, with my vision oh, problems. Like, like read it out loud to see I how like it to hear the cadence. Okay. I yeah. want to hear how it sounds. So, wow. yeah, that's the way I do it. So when I got that five grand, I thought, man, somebody else really likes it. So then I started working harder. So I got published in a really nice hardcover anthology. And then I went to law school. So that <laughs> kind of put the kibosh or kibosh on my writing. Um, first semester of law school, right on the heels of that $5,000, I get a notification from the Kentucky Arts Council said, hey, we want you to participate in an exchange program that we have in um, in Ireland. Well, now Eastern Kentucky is loaded full of Irish. That's where that's where they first migrated back mm -hmm. a long time ago. So it's an exchange program. They said we want you to come for two weeks to Ireland, and they're going to send someone our way. I was in law school. It was November. I remember it like yesterday. I thought, oh, my God, this was my breakthrough. And you work a long time for a break like this if you're a writer. I thought, shit. Okay, so I went to the dean of the college, the law school, and said, hey, showed him the letter. I said, I got this opportunity. I said, I, I'd like to go. Now, there's n n no reason in hell that he should have, could have, should have turned me down because it would have been good for the law school would have been good for me. Everybody would have benefited from this. He looked at me and he said, so pompously, he leaned back and he said, Mr. Cisco, looks like you've got a decision. Do you want to be a lawyer or do you want to be a writer? Wow. Like a thud in my gut. I took a big, deep breath and it I was embarrassed. I was hurting too. I'm like, oh my God, he just shut me down. Not even a, he was just a dick about it. So <laughs> I said, well, by that time I had rolled the dice, quit my job. We were on every damn social program in the world. I was begging people for money. I said, I guess I want to be a lawyer. Yeah, and let that go. Need, you needed it. Yeah. yeah, I didn't pick up, a, I didn't write again until after law school. Then I started picking up things again. Then I started writing grants. And mm -hmm. really, after law school, that shit really clicked, started making a, a shitload of money with the grants. Yeah, and you have a ton of 
you have a ton of content on your TikTok about writing grants too. So if yeah. anyone were interested in doing what you do, they can make yeah. they can make a ton of money writing grants too. I'm paid for this lovely condo. I'm in the closet here in the condo, but <laughs> Don't tell them you're in a closet. You're in your studio. <laughs> I'm in my, okay, we'll say it that way. I'm in my studio, paid for with with grant money that I had earned. Um, mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, anyway, so that's it. That's my writing. Yeah, I'm a writer. I love it. I would do it full time. Are these short stories like anywhere that like I could like find yeah, them? It, Where are they? You could probably find them every now and then. Um, I've got, I've been, there was a, a short book that I wrote called I've Been Transplanted. It was the very first book I ever had published. I didn't self-publish it either. It is online. I think it's online. So if you looked up I've Been Transplanted, you'll probably see some remnants of those short stories. But for you, I'll send you some if you like to read. Oh, lucky me. Yeah, I know this, this interests me. Yeah, they're really good. I mean, I like them. They're, the, the characters, you'll, they're very sympathetic uh some of them have a lot of flaws and uh would you ever consider selling them oh yeah i had so i'm trying to and i got all these projects and i've really tried to narrow them down but i got a bunch of shit bunch of stuff in a can um this collection of short stories called a little east of eden it's uh i've got a book that's probably um geez 140 40 or 150 pages of short stories. And they're, they're, you can see all these characters intertwined. So they're in this little community. I also have a novel um, that I am working on called The 99 Days of Summer. Um, so I have been working on it. And Marigold Park, which is the one I just, um, I'm about halfway through with it. And it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a love story or a coming of age story. So I have that one cooking. I don't know how you find the time to do well, all these I don't, projects. Th this, I'm going to tell you, this social media thing has gobbled up almost all of my extra time that I would consider writing. So when I sit down and I love writing, creating, I like fiction. M most judges think that my legal work are fiction. <laughs> 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 but to sit down and write, um, God. It would eat up time that I would be in front of my camera, uh, working out stuff with you. Uh, I mean, this is, I love this work and I want it to pay off, by the way, if anybody's out there, <laughs> like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> I, you know, but this is kind of neat for me now. So it's taken up all my energy. I was at a clip of about this Marigold Park, Tales from Marigold Park is... Uh, probably got 140 pages. I expect it'll be about 350 pages long. When my 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 thing is when I sit down to a computer to write, I use an old, old Ernest Hemingway trick: two pages. I go for two pages. Now on my computer, I go for two single space pages. That's roughly four four type written pages. I don't leave my computer unless I have two pages and so i look at trips to the computer i break it down mentally like i'm a runner so i'm a, a, a apply a lot of this stuff my exercise things to everyday life so i look at writing a book not as 350 pages it's just 100 trips 125 trips to the computer right and so it makes it seem less daunting maybe too yeah. when you break it down so, yeah so, right so when you're running you look at quarter miles you look at half miles an out and back course, like I hate courses that go in a loop because it almost feels like you're never, you don't know where the ending is. But on an up and back, I can kill an up and back. I don't care if it's 50 damn miles because I know at 25 miles. So in my stupid head, shit, I made it 25. I can make it 25 more. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my writing. So, you know, I've probably got another 100 trips to the computer to do that. But this stuff's taken up all my time. I need to learn to manage this more instead of posting every day. I have posted every day, even when I was sick, every day for 13 months. And look where it's gotten you. You have so many people following you now. Yeah, you 
been a big uh, part of that. So um, I'm Thank honestly, you. and I'm not being, you know, I'm not trying to kiss your ass. Uh, true. So I'm doing the work, but, you know, I think, and maybe I might take your advice and maybe go and do one day where I'm just doing content. Oh, and, like batch it. Yeah. Batch your content. That's yeah. a neat and idea. Then... But then something hits you in the head because I create, I'm thinking all the time. So I think that's when you just rip out the phone and you just do something in 30 yeah. seconds. So do do a content shoot once a week or like a big one once a month or every two weeks, whatever works for you. But if an idea comes along and you want to make a video right then and there, do it. Yeah. There's no, there's oh, no I'm rules, in the car right? all the time. My wife yeah. goes shopping. I said, do whatever you do. I got an idea. Boom. Put that camera out there and I'll go to town. We need to talk about what we came here to talk about. Get it, baby. <laughs> Okay, we're talking about lie detector tests. This was such an interesting topic that you just recently had. Sp you made a couple videos on it, I believe, on your TikTok. Yeah. And yeah. it's something that's always interested me personally as well. Now, do you do you know how they work, like te technologically how they work? Well, they measure, yeah, they roughly. Um, so what, what happens is we've been doing lie detector tests. Uh, they've been around since the late 1800s. The very first lie detector test or what they call polygraph, the lie detect, the polygraph people don't like it when you dumb it down for everybody. Uh, they, they, they want it called polygraph, but we, we'll call it lie detector. So, well, th well, that's another question of mine. Is that like the brand, like, is that at the company that created no, it? Like, what is, it's just, no, it's just, a, it's just a normal person way of looking at it. Because it, okay. it's, you know, but the polygraph people want to tell you, and this is, this is the part about most all of this stuff that, that law enforcement use and not just law enforcement, employers, anybody else. So it's a machine. First off, ooh, it's a machine. It's, you're, oh my God, it's a machine. It's got dials and buttons and wires and they hook you up. So they hook you up and they measure your breathing, your respiration, um, they measure your uh, pulse rate, uh, your heart rate. So there's a lot of uh, physiological data that goes into this machine. They also had some time ago, they had such bad, uh, the science on this is bad, not good. I don't know why. Well, a lot of places don't use them anymore. So, so they hook you up to all these things. And then they say, oh, but let's, Instead of just asking, going right for the guts and asking you, well, did you kill your wife? You know, <laughs> let's ask a few subtle questions like, if I told you you had a green tie on, what would you say? Hmm. I'd look down. I would say, I'm not even wearing a tie. Well, that elicits a controlled response. Like it's a controlled right. question. Has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the thing. And then they go for the jugular. But, but so I ask a bunch of those. Uh, they're called control, uh, control questions. Okay, so they do a lot of these irrelevant, then move to the relevant. So, so the, because they saw the machine was flawed, so they thought, well, we're going to add another layer. So kind of sneak up on people. <laughs> Just, you know, we'll trick them. But still, you're, you've got the, the wires and everything. And so it measures all these that you've got the administrator. So all of this stuff is flawed. Every bit of this crap is flawed. It's junk science. And the data shows that. And it's flawed for one large reason. Now, the, 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 those tests are really good. Those instruments are really good at detecting physiological change because there is a certain physiological change that happens when you're under stress and if you're particularly if you're not telling the truth or, or maybe even if you're telling the truth, that's the problem. These machines, you can mask them. There's no doubt about it. In fact, our CIA director, I think it was our CIA director back, I think maybe 30 years ago had, had noted that Europe, Eastern Europeans were the best at beating a lie detector test. And he surmised that, most every culture, most every country raises their kids not to tell a lie. They don't have that problem in a lot of these European countries, the Eastern Europeans is what he was talking about. But back then we were in the Cold War with Russia and uh, East Germany. And 
So they were making him look kind of probably he it was probably in his best interest to throw some shade on those people. So he said they were really good at it because they didn't have that constraint. So so what happens is, is that's how they're made. They, they measure to answer your question. They measure a lot of physiological changes that are supposed to, according to some scientists, um, be able to tell if you're if you're being truthful about a particular question. But but what I was just going to say, who decides what the questions are going to be? Because you said that they start off with controlled questions. So your heart rate is low and then they go for the jugular. Obviously, like a, a like a did you kill your wife question? Like even if you didn't do it, that's like such an outrageous yeah, question. Your heart so, rate's probably going to go up. So is that also like the, the, the format of the question and like the order of the questions, is that also a tactic? You just caught the inherent problem with these things not just these but other stuff on my on the, on my other platforms i talk about canine searches i talk about field sobriety tests anything where there's a human involved you can bet your ass there's going to be a problem with it because we're humans we're not perfect even if you are trained perfectly on these things we all carry a certain amount of bias within us that will cause us to um, inflection of our voice. Um, like when you, or even to score a test, someone might see something two other people don't see when they're looking at these tests. So because, and you picked it up, humans are involved in the administration of these tests. Humans are involved in the analysis uh, of these tests. And so therefore, you are subject to that person, not necessarily the data that the test elicits. It's the, it's the supposition or the uh, predetermined um, thoughts of the person giving the test and scoring the test. So that's the problem with it. And it's the way you, it's the way you ask the question. You can ask the question. So Mr. Cisco, you know, you're, you know, we're, some of your friends that said you were out uh, playing golf with your buddies the other night. Um, and your wife, when you came home, was your wife already dead? You know, there's a different way of saying that. Or there's there's that way, which kind of puts you at ease. It doesn't seem real threatening other than saying, so, Mr. Cisco, you said you was out golfing. And what did you say when you came home and your wife was dead? Right. Like, you know, but but even so, this is what the science says. After and and it's not like we've and and not this is not just our country. The lie detector tests or polygraph machines have been examined for well over a hundred years, and there is no conclusive science. There is no court, no credible court, even in the world. I looked at India, Israel. Um, Europe, countries in Europe, they don't use them because there's no credible evidence that says that they're valid. The 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 variables swing from side to side. So there's no way in hell you're you're a fool if you take a lie detector test. You're just a fool. Um, so it's not even necessarily the like the the instrument, the machine. It collects data correctly but but you can't you, you can't say that the person is lying based on that data no right the data data what um statistical data and there's an old politician that said you know there's um lies damn lies and statistics because it's what it is um the data that you get and the way you get the data is different. And then, like I said, it, it doesn't matter if it's a field sobriety test at a DUI checkpoint or a drug sniff dog. You've got a human involved that is administering that test and recording the results. Those are the two factors that make this inherently problematic. I mean, right off the bat. You said that uh, it's uh, it can't be used in court, but are there still some organizations that try to use it? Well, now in in federal courts, so say can't be. So it this is one of these l lawyer <laughs> answers. It depends, um, which 
the courts have said federal courts, they can't use them in criminal cases. Federal courts said, no, you cannot unless the parties agree. So I studied on that one. Like, why the hell would why the hell would parties agree? Well, I know why a party would agree. If I had a client and they passed a lie detector test, I might want that. I might ask the prosecutor, hey, we took your polygraph machine and your guy and you say we passed. But why would a prosecutor want me to do that? Well, who knows why a prosecutor might. They might have so much other overwhelming evidence or they might let you admit that in because they don't have enough evidence and maybe they're kind of giving up. You know, you can bet your ass if you fail that lie detector test, your lawyer ain't wanting. I was going to, it's, it's risky. It's yeah, lie. you would never, it's very yeah, if, risky. If, especially if it was bad. You, yeah, you, exactly. You, I don't know. That's almost like malpractice. I don't know why a lawyer would want that in. It's stupid because they're not admissible unless, unless uh, both parties agree. Now, it's in a criminal case. Civil cases are a little different. Civil cases, you can just about agree to anything and a judge don't care. They just don't care if the parties agree. You agree, um, you know. They 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 occur. What which was odd to me. It's like a two billion dollar business, two and a half billion, I think, a year. It might be more than that. That's that's an old stat. It might be a couple years old. So, but interestingly, the majority of people that take these tests are professionals, firefighters, um, police officers. Uh, first responders, and and I I don't know I honestly don't know why that would be other than you know maybe some internal investigations on the part of these agencies wanting to find out you know used to be a store a store could use it if they suspected that you were had your hands in the cash register <laughs> uh, really oh yeah uh, I can remember that it's not just been it's not been too long that they have. And said, no, you can't use them in employment issues. You can't use them for pre-employment and you can't use it con for contingencies to keep uh, employment, to keep employed. But but I am, they will use them if you voluntarily, and I am amazed at the people that will volunteer to do one. You'll see criminals do it. See, that that confuses me. Why Why would a criminal agree to it? I, I know I, I know an innocent person would be like, I didn't do anything wrong, so I will pass this test, but... Right, but a criminal thinks I'm slick. I got this, baby. Outsmart, outsmart yeah, the, I'm the, uh, the, guy the, the in police the, officer. I'm the smartest guy in the cell block, man. Come on. And they agree to take them without a lawyer's advice, and that is just stupid. In that book I'm reading, a dude did, they, they lied... He took three of them, passed them all, but the officers who are allowed to lie told him each and every time you failed, you failed. So they, so they wanted him to do another test, another test. Yeah, they wanted test. to, they wanted to keep doing it until he failed. Really, to really fail. But then, but if he are, if he was being told that he failed, why would he agree to do another? Like, what did they say to him? Because he believed mistakenly a lot of people, the psychology on these things are crazy. If you're innocent, you want to prove you're innocent. So if you get you get an administrator who 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 says the wrong thing or makes you unduly nervous or doesn't like you, scores it incorrectly, tells you that you failed, oh you're screwed. You don't have anything to you're you're just screwed. So the psychology of them is really crazy. So you, um, you got these people who want to prove their innocence, and then you've got people who think they can really arrogant. You know, if yeah, if you've got a daggone criminal history as long as your leg, you're gonna think that you've just about got it. Despite the fact, I always tell people it's always weird to me when I go visit people in jail as an attorney. I would see people on probation violation for having failed drug screens. <laughs> so. Like they've been in jail a long time for many multiple offenses, yet they're going to tell their buddy how to pass a drug screen, right? So, so they just think they're smart, man. Despite the fact they've been in trouble their whole life, and they think they've got it. You know, they're slick. 
I mean, there's probably cases of innocent people failing the test because Lots. they're they're just like super nervous about, you know, maybe like being wired up, being hooked up, being asked questions about the, I the believe topic. It, I believe that, the, see, the American Psychological Association wanted to put a lot of credibility into, they want to put a lot of credibility into these things. And so they tout a, a, a data point that says 80%. Now, pardon me, that's utter bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's nowhere near that. So then after a while, and there was like 80 studies that they ran. So then the national, it might have, it, it's a National Scientific Academy or National Academy of Science. I think I get that confused. I don't have notes with me. So they reviewed all of the literature that was performed and all the studies that was performed by the Psychological Association. And what they found was 57 of those 80 samples were so flawed that they wouldn't pass scientific muster on their own. The, the, the samples were flawed. So you had a really small sample to begin with. Then you even have a smaller sample because the ones they were hinging on were flawed scientifically. And so what they concluded was that those machines are a little better than a coin flip but they're nowhere near the standard of perfection that you would require, particularly if you're using them in a criminal case, because we should have the highest standards. You know, DNA wasn't admitted until, you know, it's in our recent past because it is, it's repeatable. Good scientific method is something that is repeatable. It's valid because it's repeatable across different people. So DNA is science. We call that science today. It is 99.9% uh, valid and it's repeatable. You can take, you can take one person, 10,000 DNA samples and the results are going to be the same. That The lie detector is not that way. Uh, right. But why do you think the American Psychological Association wants the uh, polygraph test to be um, prominent? Probably because they were in they were in bed with it. I mean, you know, that was something that they could because, you know, I think maybe they were searching for that thing that they thought they had that they could stand behind and it gave them credibility. So if they're back in this machine that 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 everybody says is good, then they're top dogs, you know, they then they get to control. And I don't know this. I'm just spitballing. Uh they get to control then other segments of this machine, maybe. Who knows? Uh, they get to control the standards, the regulations. They get to control the protocol and procedure. Um, I think there's a number of things that they did. it Because surely if they looked at the science, they know that their science was flawed. They knew their science was flawed. Yeah. They had to have known it because it was such a big sample, you know, 57 of 80. I mean, what do you got there? I mean, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Now, you had said that uh, employers would use them in the workplace. Um, I'm assuming that's banned now. They can't, use, they can't yeah, do that you anymore? Can't. You can't. But there are still people who say, give me a lie detector. I still, that, I still hear that. They can give me a lie detector test. Like, <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> you probably don't. Yeah, because like the, it, it's risky, even if you are telling the truth, right? It is one of the most stupid things you can do. It is like, it's the stupidest thing if you're accused of a crime. Do police officers use them at all or did mm -hmm. they ever at all? They use, yeah. now they allow, you know, they still use them as investigatory. And which is the cruelest thing that a police officer can do is to say to an individual, I, if you'll agree to take this lie detector test, this just might prove you're innocent. Oh my God. You see, those officers know they're, they're schooled in the constitution uh, of our country, they know, like a lawyer does, you do not have to prove you're innocent. So, but that's the fallacy. So they're playing on the psychology of an individual that wants to, people are always wanting to prove they're innocent. I just yeah. tell people, shut up, make them prove that you did it. Yeah. You shut up and let someone prove. And so people, and they know this. So inherently, you will see someone say, okay, well, like in this book where they gave that dude three times and um, the confession is the name of the book, three times. Each time he kept thinking, God, if I do this, they'll leave me alone. 
Because that's what people, people want just to be left alone, particularly if they know they didn't do anything wrong. Like, it's like, what, what do I have to do? And what I've learned with a lot of law enforcement, you can't do enough. You know, you're not ever going to be able to do enough, man. Once, once they think you're, once they think they got you, you, there's almost nothing you can say. It's nuts. But the psychology is really weird on those machines. Yeah, I think I think the one thing that we've learned today is never because you don't you can say no to taking one, right? You don't yeah. have to take one. No. Yeah. So never take a lie detector test. Never take a polygraph test. Yeah, I and mean, we said you know with the, with the forensic interview, if there someone's inter, if a law enforcement's interviewing you about a crime, if you think that there's a any chance of if there if you think there's any chance in hell that they might be able to tie you to that crime, you are a complete fool. If you take if if you have an interview with them or if you take any of their tests, just because they already think you've done it, they get their guys in to administer the test. They get their guys in or I'm saying that generically. It could be a woman. Um, They get their people in to administer and score the test and you are screwed See, I always thought, I mean, and this just is me watching TV, um, that the person actually conduct, not not asking the questions, because sometimes the, the, the person that's um, monitoring the machine, they're not always asking the questions, are they? No, and the, the most often they're not because they're scoring right. it. Right. So the, per- okay, so the person that's scoring it, but you're saying that, that the person that's scoring it could theoretically be their people, like in quotations? They most likely are. Because I always thought it was like a third party, like someone like, okay, we need a polygraph test, bring them in. You hire the the polygraph test (laughs) service provider to come in. (laughs) If you're a lawyer, you call them whores. Oh. So, yeah, I know it's a bad word. But these are people that you pay as a lawyer to come in and tell you what you want to happen. They, They tell you. If you are a lawyer and you want a certain result, then you know a doctor or a place you can go as an expert to get the result you want. A doctor. So they got their own people. So if you're working and you have a contract for the state police to do these tests, how many tests are you going to get if time after time after time you say, that eh, person, he's telling the truth. <laughs> How I'm going to give you one guess. How many people do you think you're going to be? How many times are they going to employ you if time after time after time you have a defendant who gets hooked up to the machine? And at the end, you, your conclusion is, oh, sorry, guys, it looks like you didn't do it. Well, you know, you wouldn't get hired. No. And you know that <laughs> if you're a provider, you know that. Got to throw them a bone, you know. I got to, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm the professional here, but the reality of it is got to throw these people a bone. No one's honest anymore. Well, you know, that's why I said you call them whores, man, for a reason, because they'll do what you want them to do. And that's, you know, that's not a sexist term. I've seen many man whores (laughs) in my life. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you learn something every day. Learn something new every day. Well, is there anything else that you wanted your listeners to to learn about or know about in this topic at all? A lot of this subjects, you know, when we talk about the law stuff, I just encourage people, listen, and I get this in my comments a lot, you know, if you're on TikTok, you get, I try to keep my TikToks a minute and a half, okay? Um, sometimes under a minute, but a minute and a half seems to be my sweet spot. You can't say everything you need to say about a topic or even a little sliver of a topic. You just can't. So get these people picking you. Well, you didn't mention this. Well, hell, I can't. I can't possibly cover every conceivable problem. Um, so I get a, a lot of comments, very peculiar and picky, and which is great. I love comments. So I'm not hating on the comment. So if you have a real in-depth question, and if you're not sure about the information I'm given, Contact another lawyer. In fact, I get a lot of lawyers on my page that say, perfect. And a lot of my stuff comes from very credible sources. Um, The American Civil Liberties Union, for one, I use them a lot. Um, And public defender advocates, people who are in there working with people 
who are usually getting the crappy end of the legal stick. If you have a problem about anything I'm saying, you always ask me a question to clarify or just go to another lawyer. Spend spend 150 bucks. Well, probably more than that. <laughs> you know, spend 500 bucks and get you an appointment and go talk to uh Go talk to a real lawyer instead of a TikTok lawyer. I get that. Lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Aw. You want those TikTok? I don't know. I'm You're not a, a TikTok lawyer. I talk about a lot of other crap other than law, but uh, or they can pay me seventy nine bucks, and I'll happily research their <laughs> issue. There you go. <laughs> so, Click on his you know, link. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's what I always about any kind of issue, man. Um, people hate lawyers, and people hate what we do until they need you. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, it's always better to have a lawyer. It's always better to have a lawyer and not need it than to need one and not, and not have, have one. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, Agreed. that's just, you should do that, and especially if you're in business. Like you're in business. Um, I'm in business, but I work, you know, I work for free, but I do hire my own lawyer. And when I get, if I get in what I think is a little, it, mostly if I have something that I don't want to handle myself, I I pay someone to do it. Okay. Well, th thank you for joining me this week. It was a delight as always. All right. All right. And I appreciate, I, I appreciate your work. So I want to give you a plug. So uh, <laughs> I know you don't like this, but damn it. <laughs> this is your show. <laughs> I know it is, but just say where you're at. Where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me on TikTok. My um, my handle is Content Queen with a K. Content with a K because my name is Katie. Thought that was pretty clever. Um, and then Content underscore Creations on Instagram. Um, I'm on YouTube as well. I believe I believe it's Content Queen. But we can put all of this stuff in the description of the video. I have 112 followers. Or subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> on YouTube. Well, hopefully yes. you get some more with this podcast rolling out. Oh, yeah, we hope. So we'll we'll keep hacking at it. So, yeah, but thank yeah. you very much. It, it was a pleasure. Until next time. Turn me around, help me to the door. I'll never make it on my own. Turn me around.